All right. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well, and the wind blew you in here tonight. So um, hopefully the storms will uh, calm down before they get to us. I hadn't seen any other indications of them in West Kentucky, anything major going bad. So uh, hopefully everything will be fine. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we begin. <clears throat> Ms. Dini Hernan is at the Medical Center of Franklin. She's in room 1019. She's undergoing some tests at the moment, and um, we'll see if we can find out any more about that as soon as we can. Betsy Mallory was supposed to have surgery today. It got postponed again to next week. So it's going to be next week, uh, next Wednesday, at Vanderbilt Hospital. Uh, please remember, all ladies or even the guys, if y'all want to go to a baby shower, <laughs> that's Sunday afternoon for Gracie. James and Daniel Warden, that's at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Um, please attend that if you can. Our Everyone Counts is this coming Sunday. Uh, if you saw in the Pathfinder, uh, this uh, month for April, we are going to be uh, focusing our collection going to Eastern European Missions. And they are also helping out over in the area of the Ukraine and in that area, Poland, all the countries around there. And what they're mainly doing right now is buying Bibles for the kids in that area in their native languages. So that's uh, one, they're, they're begging for Bibles over there. So that's where a lot of this money is going to go, go towards to Eastern European missions. So that's for Everyone Counts. <clears throat> we have been doing Everyone Counts and putting the black box back by the Welcome Center. But we're going to stop that for uh, the time being. We're going to get back to going like we used to do it. So we'll be passing the baskets twice this coming Sunday morning. And uh, once will be for the regular contribution, and then the everyone counts will be passed during the second contribution on that on this coming Sunday. Uh, those of you interested, any of the kids interested, we're going to try to get a group a group of uh, kids up to go to Cookville Bible Bowl. That's in usually held in September. They're studying the Book of Joshua, and you can see Jenna Utley for more information about that. All right, let's everybody stand. Let's stand. We'll sing this first song. And our next song, I'm going to lead the first song, and then Brooks is getting ready for Lad's Leaders. He's going to be leading us in the second song. And then um, Jerry has our devotional message tonight. <clears throat> Who's that walking down the road, carrying such a heavy load? Sinner, lay your burden down, because you're walking on heaven's road. And when you're walking on heaven's road, you got to lay down my heavy load. Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I've got sunshine in every day. So won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Young folks walking hand in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folks ain't so tired no more because they're walking down heaven's road. And when you're walking down heaven's road, you got to lay down my heavy load. Sweet Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I've got sunshine in every day. So won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Ain't no tears, no cries. There ain't no sadness anywhere. Ain't got time to shed no tears. Cause I'm walking down heaven's road. And when you're walking down heaven's road, you gotta lay down my heavy load. Sweet Jesus said he'd walk along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I've got sunshine in every day. So won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? As Brooks coming up, I wanted to let you know, I forgot to tell you that we've packed 109 buckets. So thank you for that. Thank the teenagers for helping us load. We were going to load after class, but I think it was going to be raining a little bit. So the teenagers helped us load. Eli, myself, and Karen Byron be delivering those tomorrow. So pray for us as we travel to Nashville. All right, Brooks. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing all it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy that was great and great, 
place was free. Pardon the response applied to me. Then my burdens all fell in liberty. I carry. Oh, the Lord that drew salvation's birth. Oh, the grace that brought it down to me. Good evening. Feels funny to be this far away from y'all. I'm used to standing at a podium up there a little closer. I get paid extra for standing on the stage, don't I, Steve? Is that the way that works? So, that and I ain't got my microphone. I can't wander around. Nervous people like to wander around when they talk. Uh, so, when Eli texted me yesterday, wanting to know, day before yesterday, whenever it was, to, to do this, um, I initially had had, I've got several. Uh, devotionals that, that just as I studied, I said, that'd be a great, you know, little devotional. If we ever get back to doing the kind of Wednesday night devotionals, that's something I'd like to do. I, you know, it's a topic I'd like to cover, something quick. Uh, I could never preach because I couldn't stand up here and make, make sense for 25 minutes, but if you need five or 10 minutes worth of good stuff, I'm your man. Uh, but the something that I've really been thinking about a lot, I guess, in kind of... Um, my charge as an elder and my charge as a father. Um, I've been thinking about children a lot and our role as individuals, our role as Christians, our role as a church, uh, my role as an elder, um, our role as society to children. And so I've, I've put so much thought and it's been dominating my thoughts so much that I really couldn't move past thinking about anything but that. And so as I tried to collect my thoughts over the last few days to figure out exactly what I was going to say to be concise, um, I was having trouble because there was so much stuff rolling around. Um, but a point that I really want to make uh, to you tonight is we recognize and we see and we know what, what a war looks like. When we turn on our TV, at night, we see what's going on in Ukraine, and it's a terrible thing, and we recognize that. There's a very visible war that we see that's going on, and there's people that are losing their lives in that war every day. And we as a church are trying to do what we feel like we can do to help. Uh, we can't necessarily fly to the Ukraine or fly to bordering countries to try to lend aid firsthand, but we can buy stuff and put it in a bucket so that hopefully in a few weeks, somebody will get a bucket that's got stuff that they need that they left behind at their home to help their lives be better. And hopefully through that, they will see the love of Jesus in that and that they will be uplifted in that time. We have a, probably a much more, no, definitely a much more dire war that's going on. And if you'll turn on the news every day, you see the exact same things, but we're being fed those things in such a way that we don't recognize sometimes the war that we're in. We are, we are in an o a war in this world where the devil is trying to steal our souls and he is trying to steal our children. And so we have to recognize the first step in knowing what to do here is to recognize this. We ha all have to know and appreciate and recognize 
the battle that's going on around us and how it is intensifying daily. Whether or not it's true, I haven't. I, I didn't have the time today to to follow up, but I saw the headline of a story where Disney commits that in 2023, over half of the new characters that they're going to introduce will either be gay or represent some portion of the LGBT, whatever acronyms you want to lay after that. I can remember Daddy telling me that when they was a kid, there was only one. That there wasn't PG, there wasn't G, there wasn't R, there wasn't any of those movies that they were allowed to watch. The only movies that they were allowed to watch were ones that were rated WD. If it was a Walt Disney film, then there was confidence in knowing that it was good and the children could watch it. Other than that, they weren't allowed to watch it. And so, my how things have changed. So, my plea to you tonight is to recognize the war that we have before us. Recognize the fact that there are factions in this world that the devil has firmly in his grasp that seek to destroy and to devour our children. And then I need each one of us to recognize the part that we play in that battle. If you're a parent, you need to recognize that. And you need to do the things in your life to model a Christian behavior to your children. We need to make sure that our children see that God is the most important thing. How many times do we blow off a worship service to go to ball practice? We'd never, never even imagine missing a ball practice for other than something that's very serious but we can miss a worship service for whatever reason that we need to. Do we put the same level of devotion in the study in the Bible as we do to catching ground balls or hitting free throws? We as a church, how often do we provide encouragement and love to these children? There's an outstanding group of young men and women that come here every Wednesday night and as an opportunity we have to show them love. How often do we do it? One of the ideas that I had for trying to, as a church to embrace our youth more was to support them in their outside activities. And so uh, we've begun asking and we're going to continue to ask just like I'm asking right now for for you young folks and you parents of young folks, if your children do something, if they have an activity outside of church, whether it's a sport, whether it's anything, if they participate in something, let us know about it. And church, I challenge you to try to find an opportunity to go and watch these kids play ball, watch them in their recitals, watch them do their play. Whatever it is that their passion is outside of here that they enjoy, what an uplifting thing for them to look in the crowd and speak, see people from their church family that's there to support them in that. What a thing that would say about our church to the community. You know, we didn't have any trouble filling 107 buckets to go to the Ukraine. But sometimes it's a challenge to find enough people to teach class on Sunshine Street. And they do an outstanding job of preparing the lessons. All you got to do is, is read. Don't even have to come up with the material. Just care enough to stand in a room and read. It would be a great thing if people complain because it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to teach on Sunshine Street. When's my turn? So that's my challenge. That's what I've been thinking about. I hope you'll think about it too. If you would, pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this day that you've created for us. We're grateful for this opportunity that we were able to get together, to build each other up, to be there for each other, to encourage each other. 
Lord, help us to look for ways to be a light to those around us. Help us to look for ways to serve each other. Lord, help us to love on our children. Help them to see your love through us. Help us to be encouragers, to be supporters. Help us to fill the holes that we all have in our hearts with Christ. Lord, we pray that as these storms come through the now, tonight, that you will be with us and keep us safe as we travel, be with our homes, be with those that we love. Lord, please be with this church. Please be with us. Help us to always glorify you in the things that we do. Help us to be a light in this world of darkness. Help as we conduct ourselves outside of these walls that people know that we do not belong to this world, but we belong to you. Thank you for loving us. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we fail you. Please protect us from the evil one. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Don't head to class. All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It's good to see everybody. As Kirby said, glad it blew everybody in here tonight. I tell you, I've had a hard time staying on the ground today. It's been pretty rough out there. So as we get to the end of our series here, we are talking about overcoming prejudice. Uh, once again, if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to text that number up there and we will include that in the prayer here at the end and also if you I think Eli did a pretty good job making sure everybody had a handout but if you don't there's some extra ones in front of Mary Patton here all right so prejudice everybody's been asking me for about a week now what's my next topic going to be <clears throat> I said well it's prejudice and everybody went oh oh no you know it's like everybody started offering me condolences you know instead of like all right I started getting in my head a little bit. I thought, oh, man, what did I get myself into here? All right, but so prejudice can take on all kinds of forms. It is a spiritual heart disease that takes over all of us. Without realizing it, we have all probably shown prejudice in some way or another, or we have 
had that affect us in some way or another. Despite our best efforts, we are all going to show prejudice from time to time. Think about the people you surround yourself with. Is your inner group, is it full of people that look like you, that dress like you, have the same interests and the same hobbies? You know, how many times do you strike up a conversation with somebody that doesn't look like you? It's pretty rare. So what is prejudice? It, to me, it seems like a very fancy word that we use a lot, but sometimes I don't exactly know the meaning. So prejudice means to judge someone or something prematurely, you know, without having all the facts of the situation or really without having any facts at all. You're kind of looking at something at face value and just making a predetermined judgment based on what you see, what you hear, things like that. And as much as we may not like to admit it, we're all guilty from it from time to time. See, when we suffer from the spiritual heart disease of prejudice, we have a closed mind. We choose to condemn rather than investigate. And oftentimes, we mistake our ignorance for something as reason. So when we think of prejudice, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Skin color, right? It's probably what we're all thinking of. Something that we see very prevalent, not only in our country, but in our world. We prematurely judge somebody based on the color of their skin, which is ridiculous. So if you'll bear with me here, I got a little biology rabbit hole for us. The skin tone is nothing more than a measure of how much melanin a person's body produces. Now, melanin is a protein that adds pigment to your skin and your hair. The more melanin that somebody produces, the darker their skin. And see, God created us humans with this fantastic ability to be able to resist the sun's UV rays. All right, take a look at the geo chart up here. It shows the countries along the equator line, and you'll notice that towards the equator line, the skin is darker, and as you get further away from that equator, you get more towards the poles, the skin color gets lighter. You see at the equator, the way that the earth is tilted, that's where the harshest beams of the sun are. So you need to produce more melanin to protect yourself. God put that into your body. And so the further away you get from the equator and towards the poles, your skin tone gets lighter. See, the sun's rays are not as strong at the poles as they are at the equator. So if your skin tone gets lighter, you produce less melanin. So why is all this important, what I'm telling you? Because just how too much sun can be harmful, you need to produce a lot of melanin to protect yourself. Too little sun can be very harmful as well. As we all remember from school, the sun gives us vitamin D. It's very important to our bone structure and to our stability. All right, the less melanin, in this case for the people at the poles, it helps them absorb these nutrients better. See, it's almost like God knew exactly what we were gonna need, exactly where he put us. See, none of this stuff's by accident. A lot of times we like to think that salt water just evolved and created all of this perfection and harmony, and that's not the case. God knew exactly what he was doing and had a specific plan for everything. But you see, our skin, it may absorb light, but it does not reflect our character. And to think that humans will judge somebody, judge their character based on their skin color is ridiculous. I, I, found, I am reminded of a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation well, they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. See, racism may not be a problem for anybody here in the room. That's great. But I challenge you to really reflect on your life and your attitude and your interactions with each other. To make sure that your judgment on somebody is not based solely on their outside appearance. 
So now you may be thinking, I'm not, I'm not racist. I don't have a problem with that at all. That's not an issue in my life. That is a great start. But I'm here to tell you tonight, where we're going to spend a lot of our time, is that prejudice is very, very sneaky. It will sneak up on you in very many forms. And what we think is harmless is actually another form of prejudice. Think about it like this. You ever see, we've all been in this situation. You ever see a homeless man pull up to the street light and you look over and you say, he's not really homeless, he just wants a quick buck. He just don't want to work. Right? We have no idea what this man's life or this woman's life is. But we think that. I know I've done it from time to time. Or you ever been sitting in a parking lot, see somebody get ready to walk by and you look up and you reach over and lock your doors real quick? You think, oh, they might open my car door. You see, it's sneaky like that. It takes on way more forms than just skin color. So up here I got a picture of the Duck Dynasty guys, if anybody is not familiar with them. But it was a pretty big craze. Everybody is quite familiar. I have a very fond spot for the Duck Dynasty guys. They were the ones who... I remember watching and I thought, hey, you know, maybe being a Christian ain't all about rules. Maybe you can have fun actually doing this, you know. They kind of sparked my interest in this. But up there to the right, or, yeah, to the right, you'll see a picture of Jace Robertson. And when the show was at its peak, I guess, they went to New York to do a spotlight on a morning news segment. They were going to promote the show and all that good stuff. So while they were there... In New York, they stayed at this fancy hotel, real swanky, as we always called it growing up. It was a real ritzy, glitzy kind of thing. So they're all standing in the lobby and getting ready to check into their rooms and all this. You know, they're getting the VIP treatment. Well, Jace said that he had to go to the bathroom. So he walked over to the, the uh, concierge desk. You know, he said, he asked him, can you show me where the bathroom is? And the guy says, oh, absolutely, sir, right this way. So they start walking, they go through a room, and they go through another room, and he goes, you know, when we started going through the kitchen, I thought, man, this bathroom that we are going to is fancy. It is secretive, right? And he said the guy walked him all the way through, and all of a sudden they got to the door, and he opened up the door, and Jay said that he walked through it, and he was outside staring at Central Park. And he thought, what happened? And he turned back around, and the guy said, pointed at the park and said, there you go, sir, have a nice day, and closed the door on him. And see, uh, he said, I stood there for a minute thinking, I think I just got kicked out of this hotel. So he walked back around, and he comes back in through the front door, and his whole family standing there, and they look up, and they said, I thought you were going to the bathroom. And he said, no, I just got kicked out of this place. So they all had a big laugh about it, and everybody was joking around. But see, they, they judged him by his appearance. I mean, if you look at him, rightfully so, he's long hair and beard. He always said before, he said, I've been showing up late and dirty my whole life, right? So he was, you can relate to the person who escorted him out. But they chose to condemn rather than investigating. They didn't stop to say, what's your name? You know, are you a guest here? Anything like that. They instantly saw his appearance and they said, okay, let's get this guy out of here, right? So now you may be thinking, oh, man, man, I have done some of these things, right? I mean, you're like me when I was trying to think of this. I thought, man, this prejudice thing is way more common in my life. I've got to do some self-reflecting here, you know? But we, get, we let prejudice get in our minds, and we form this web of lies about somebody, and we accept this lie as truth. And that brings me back to our main verse that we've talked about this whole series of a stronghold. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Just how we talked about in our devotional this morning, it talks about this spiritual war that we in. It says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought 
to make it obedient to Christ. See, prejudice is a stronghold. It is an all-consuming thought that's based not on God's truth, but on Satan's lies. And without changing our way of thinking, without foregoing our thinking and thinking like God, we can't break this stronghold. We can't cure this spiritual disease. Now, I've been the victim of prejudice many times. You know, I got tattoos. I don't usually dress up by no means. You're not going to find me in a suit and tie many times. I used to have long hair past my shoulders. You know, for a lot of people, I was the textbook visual of what a heathen looked like. And a lot of people was not afraid to tell my mom that either. <laughs> but we've all been in that position where we have been judged unfairly based on our jobs, based on our last name. I got a picture of D. Snyder up there. If you remember when he spoke, it was in 1985, he spoke at Congress about the censorship of music. And the Congress people, they were inviting all these rock and roll guys to come to represent the opposition towards the censorship. And they originally wanted the Vince Neil, who is the lead singer of Motley Crue, because they basically said, well, that guy's an idiot. He's going to make us look good if we get him up here and try to argue against us. So he couldn't do it. And so Dee Snyder, who is the lead singer of Twisted Sister, he volunteered. And so he walks in looking like he is in these suit and tie world of Congress. And he sits down in his cut off shirt and they ask him for his remarks and he pulls out a crumbled piece of paper out of his jean pocket. And then he starts talking like you have, like he has studied at Harvard for years. And instantly everybody's face starts to go, uh oh, oh no, oh no, we messed up here. Everybody starts backpedaling. It's on YouTube if you want to check it out. But see, they unfairly prejudged him you know and he told them that he was a family man with kids he didn't drink he didn't do drugs he was a Christian and all this he caught them all off off guard because they instantly assumed well this guy we know what he's about think about this the church we are victims of prejudice all the time right people refuse to believe in Jesus or even step foot inside of a church because they get so convinced that everybody here is judging them as soon as they walk in. That as soon as they walk through that door, we're all looking at them going, uh-huh, you big sinner. You better go down front right now. Right? Or they had a bad experience with a Christian. Maybe made them feel less than. And so they assume that all of us as Christians are going to treat them that way too. And prejudice is also sneaky in this way. At times, we get so hyper-focused on thinking that people are judging us that we automatically assume that we're being judged, like we're the victim. <laughs> All right, so this whole time, I have used Mary Patton or my grandma as examples to pick on somebody, right? So tonight, is, it's my turn. I'm going to be the one that I'm going to pick on myself. Now, I have been saving this story for 10 years now, okay? And me and Mary Patton laugh about this all the time. So if you guys, if it falls short, at least laugh and humor me because it's going to be a crushing blow if this is not as good as what we think. Well, you see, about... I like guess almost 10 years ago now, me and Mary Patton started going together. And one night we were, we were in Bowling Green, and it was a Sunday afternoon or a Wednesday night, one of the two, I can't remember. And so we're driving back down the interstate, and she says, hey, you want to go to church with me tonight? And I was, you know, we're dating, right? You can, I'm, well, I still try to do this, but back then, you know, you're like, yeah, absolutely, girl, heck yeah. You know, and, she's, and then, then I thought, uh, wait a minute, where do you go to church at again? And she said, oh, I go to Church of Christ. I was like, oh, okay, okay. And in my head, I'm thinking, wait a minute, ain't those the ones that said they're, on, they're the only ones going to heaven? 
It's like, oh, I don't know. I've only heard bad things about Church of Christ. And I was like, oh. So I'm over here sweating immediately. We're going along a little bit more, and I was like, oh, oh man. I said, is this if what I'm wearing okay? Do I need to try to go find something else? She said, no, no, it's not a big deal. Everything's good. It's like, okay, okay. So, you know, at this point, I had only been, you know, I had, I was baptized maybe three weeks prior. I had not, I was new into this Christian realm, right? Still trying to figure all this stuff out. So we get to, we get here at the church, and we walk in. And when you first walk into this place, I don't know if you guys know it or not, but it is an intimidating building. I mean, this place is way too big, especially if you just now got around to this Christian thing. So we start walking into even this bigger room here, and we're walking, we're walking, and I'm thinking, man, are we going to the front row or what? Right? I am, I mean, at this point, I'm like, oh, boy, oh, boy. So we get down, you know, about midways, and we sit down. I'm like, all right, everything's good now. I'm set down. I'm going to be here, be, be out, right? So we go through the lesson. And, I, and the guy giving, giving the, the lesson, I look up, and he has on blue jeans and some cowboy boots. So I'm like, okay, all right, I'm not too far out of place here. Yes, I got it. And now it was the one giving the lesson was none other than, than Mr. Steve. And Mr. Steve, this is why I've been asking if you were going to be here for like six weeks. So I wanted you to hear this story. I've been sitting on it, man, for a long time here. So we, so we get towards the end of the lesson, you know, and Steve is killing it as always, and he's walking. And I'm sitting about where Mary Patton is, maybe a little closer, where she's sitting at tonight. So he's walking around, and he gets to the end of the lesson. He goes, okay, now you think there's anybody here tonight that maybe needs to walk on down and you might need to go ahead and maybe you need to be washed in the blood and I remember I went and I was like I, and then he was still I leaned over to Mary Patton and said he's talking to me and she said no no he's not He's like, just feel free to come on down here and we'll help you. And I thought, he is talking to me now. What am I going to do? I'm thinking, do I stand up and say, no, I'm in. I made it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going with you guys. Right? So the whole time I had got so focused on all these preconceivements, all these judgments that I had made, against the Church of Christ and everybody in it, that I wasn't even focused on the lesson. I was so focused on thinking that I was the victim the whole time, that everybody was judging me, right? And the best thing about that is, is that Mr. Steve has been nothing but polite and kind to me and encouraging, and he's been a godly example for all of us. So it just makes the story that much better even after, you know, moving on, so... We joke about that all the time, and a lot of times I look at Mary Patton and say, if you need to come on down, you know. But we get prejudiced in a, a variety of ways, whether it's on purpose or by accident. One of the ways we become prejudiced is towards the truth. We get set in our ways and what we believe, and we refuse to accept anything else. I remember one Sunday morning class, Jim Brown was teaching. He said that he was sitting in chapel when he was in college, and the man stood up and held his Bible, and he said, I ain't changed my mind about anything in this book in 50 years. And Jim said, man, I was so impressed by that guy at that time. And then later on in life, I realized, man, how sad is that? Because I can look at a piece of scripture just right now in my young faith, and I'll think about it one way. I can look at it two weeks later and I'm like, nah, I missed that. And this is what this is saying, not really that. A lot of times we get set in our ways and despite whatever the truth is, we become convinced of our false beliefs and we refuse to hear anything else. Galileo is a famous astronomer. We're all probably heard of him in school. Or you might have heard it in the Queen song, right? That's what I thought of. I had to look that up, it actually. But he was a, an astronomer who discovered that the sun was the center of the universe, that the earth actually rotated around the sun, not the other way around. Now, when he discovered this, his findings went against the church, right? And he was brought forward before the Inquisition, 
sounds very scary. Basically, it's a fancy name for all the judges and the punishment givers of the Catholic Church at that time. And so Galileo, he told him, he said, look through my micro, look, I mean, not my microscope, look through my telescope, and you'll see that I'm not lying. It's the truth. Look right here. But the gathering was so convinced that their way was right, they refused to even look through the telescope. They wouldn't even consider that maybe he was right and they were wrong. Think about it like this. It was the prejudice of the Pharisees towards truth that murdered Jesus. Despite all the miracles, all of the signs, despite Jesus blatantly saying, here I am, you know, they said, no, we want your blood. No, we don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, we want to kill you. And they refused to accept the truth because they had become prejudiced towards Jesus. They were saying the same thing that Nathaniel said. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? This old carpenter guy is crazy. We got to get rid of him. They closed their ears. They closed their hearts. And they closed their minds to the truth. So how do we overcome prejudice towards the truth? We have to realize what the truth does for us. And Jesus tells us specifically what the truth does for us in John 8, verse 32. He says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So free from what? Free from guilt, free from doubt, free from the stronghold of these lies that the devil puts in our heads. We can be free from being held in slavery to the devil's way of thinking. And we can finally begin to think like God and look at each other as God would. See, when, when we understand the truth, that's when the true blessings from God arrive. We know the good things that he has in store for us. So when we ignore the truth, when we refuse to accept it, not only do we deprive ourselves of God's truth, but we deprive ourselves of God's blessings. So instead of being prejudiced towards the truth, let's be willing to listen to truth, to accept it, and most importantly, apply it to our lives. If we're wrong, which we're all going to be at some point in our lives, no problem. Learn from the mistake and act accordingly. If someone we know is wrong, let's practice the method of Priscilla and Aquila and address them privately in a loving manner. I found this while I was studying for it. It says, remember, an honest person alters their opinion to fit the truth, but a prejudiced person alters the truth to fit his opinions. Another way we become prejudiced is towards each other in countless different ways. We get prejudiced towards people with other careers. You know, we say things all the time like all politicians are crooked or all police officers are bad. You know, we let the saying of don't let one bad apple spoil the barrel, we let that happen all the time. We get prejudiced towards people in regards to their intellectual level. Right? We think if you got a lot of letters behind your name that you're a genius. And if you just graduated high school, then you're pretty much an idiot. We think, ah, they don't know what they're talking about. They ain't got enough schooling. We can also show prejudice towards somebody based on their age. I mean, for example, throughout this series, many of you may have had a hard time accepting the teaching that I had to give or the advice that I had to give because of my age. Maybe thinking that I don't have enough experience to advise anyone on the situation or to teach on the subject. And the people of the Bible, they were not immune to this either. Just how we talked about how people of the Bible were not immune to discouragement and disappointments. They were not immune to showing prejudice either. I'm reminded of Peter and Paul, where Paul has to come and confront Peter for favoring the Jews and neglecting the Gentiles. Prejudice doesn't have to be all about a negative view 
of something either, right? As it says on the screen there, stereotypes aren't limited to having negative views of others. Sometimes our parents will look at their kids with rose-tinted glasses, right? And everything their kid does is perfect. Maybe they are acting up or acting out and somebody addresses that situation and they say, oh, no, little Tommy would never, never do anything like that. Or we may look at a family or a couple and they seem to have it all together. Right? They got a big house and a nice car. They go on trips and we think, oh, them people have got it figured out. You know, they have figured out life. And, you know, in America, we tend to associate all that stuff with happiness and success. And they, they, you can never be happier if you have all that stuff. <clears throat> we prematurely judge these people. We, pre, we prejudge their lives thinking they have it all figured out when behind closed doors, we have no idea what's going on. They could be just how Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. Their lives may look perfect to us on the outside, but at home they could be living in misery. And so not only is it unfair to prejudge someone, but it also puts that person in a sticky predicament, right? Because maybe those people really need our help. Maybe they are wanting to cry out for help that everything's crashing down on them. But this image that we've built up of them in our minds, in the community, they're too afraid of letting us down. They're too afraid of ruining that image. I think about it, too, also with, with kids. I remember it was this way when me and Mary Patton were in school. Kids were so focused on making sure they got a perfect grade because they thought that their parents' love and recognition was based on that grade. Our kids put so much pressure on themselves to do good in sports because they thought, if I don't get this trophy, my parents are not going to love me anymore. They're not going to be proud of me. We build up this image of them. And the list goes on and on. Right? We could sit here all night and talk about all the different forms of prejudice. These are just a few that are on the top of my head. But you see, what I wanted to point out was that prejudice will take on many forms of racism. And a lot of times we think that we're not showing this in any form, when in actuality, maybe we are. But prejudice will rear its ugly head in all walks of life. We, be we can become victims of it through harmless remarks, and we can let it make other people our victims by prejudging them based off of their career, their name, or their appearance before we ever get to know them. So how do we overcome it? Right, that's been the topic of the whole series. We lay out the problem. We've got to have a way. We've got to have a solution to fix it. And it's kind of a hard thing to advise on. So, you know, go with me on this. This is how I thought of it. Has anybody ever been to a 3D movie before? Well, everybody, thank you, ma'am. We got, we got two here. I was going to say, everybody else, y'all should check it out. You're missing out a little bit. There we go. See, the one requirement you need, I asked Mary Patton this last night and I was doing my practice run. She's heard this lesson about 47 times. And I said, all right. I said, okay, anybody been to the movie before? And she raises her hand. I'm like, thank you. All oh, right, we have a contender. And I said, what's the one requirement? And she says, popcorn. And I said, very true, very true. You got me there. But the one requirement for a 3D movie is the glasses. Right? Without it, it doesn't make sense. Everything seems blurry. I actually went into a 3D movie one time by accident, and I thought, man, this projector is messed up. And then I realized I was in the, the whole wrong uh, seating thing. But the way to overcome prejudice is we have to put on the 3D glasses of Galatians 3, 28. In that, they say, in, in that scripture, it says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, if we strive to look at everyone through the eyes of Jesus, we're not seeing what their career is. We're not seeing what their appearance is, what their skin color, what their last name is. We're seeing them as made in the image of God, 
who can further the kingdom. An individual that God has made and blessed with specific talents that you and I may not have, but specific talents to further the kingdom and show the love of Christ to the world around them. But we can't only just look at things through Jesus' perspective. We have to model his example. Right? He surrounded himself with people of all different walks of life. He was a Jew, but he didn't only love the Jews. He loved everybody, every race, every ethnicity. And Paul talks about how, as the body of Christ, back in 1 Corinthians, how we are all different parts. We're not all meant to be the same. We're not all called to be an ear. We're not all called to be a foot. Right? Think about it like this. If you have a puzzle piece, you can't just put the whole puzzle together with one piece. You need all the pieces to make the big picture. Just how we need everybody to make up the body of Christ. Psalms 130 or Psalm 133 verse 1 tells us how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. So to wrap it up for tonight, my challenge for this week, we got challenges all over the place tonight, right? We all need to be busy this week. We need to go out and introduce ourselves to someone that doesn't look like us or somebody that's not in our inner circle. You know, smile at somebody at the grocery store. You know, strike up a conversation with the waiter at the restaurant. You know, start conversations with people and make connections. That's the example that Jesus gave us. I always thought that was so cool about Jesus. He would walk up and he knew that people hated his guts. And he'd walk in and say, hey, how y'all doing? How's everybody? What's everybody up to today? You know, he wasn't afraid to break down those walls. We have to overcome prejudice by interacting with people with all walks of life. Just how we talked about earlier, we have to choose to investigate, to invest in somebody before we condemn them. You know, to go back to myself real quick to pick on me, when we're walking through a restaurant or store, I notice everybody like looks away or nobody really talks to us, or we try to say hello to the, somebody who's at the store checking us out. They don't say anything. I told Mary Patton, I said, what? What is the deal? What are, do we stink or something? What's going on? She said, it's probably because you're mean mugging everybody. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? She's like, you're always squinting. You're always doing that. Because you see, my eyes, they gave out on me a long time ago. But I do not like having these glasses on my face. With these glasses on, I can barely see y'all. Without of them, I'm just, I'm just fumbling around. You know, I think about when Jesus healed the man, and he said, how's it look? And he said, oh, everything looks like trees walking around. And he said, oh, hang on a minute. You know, I'm still in that tree phase, right? But see, a lot of people think that I'm just the maddest person in the world because, number one, I'm mean mugging everybody all the time trying to see my way through life. And number two, I'm, I'm terribly shy. You know, growing up, my biggest fear was public speaking. And here I am on this stage, I don't know how. But if someone chose to condemn me before investigating, then they assume I'm an angry person, stay away from this guy, you know, don't strike up a conversation. So Jesus showed love to the world by one conversation at a time. So let us all, this week as we go out, strive to cure this spiritual heart disease of prejudice with one conversation at a time. That's my lesson for tonight. I thank you all for listening. And also, thanks for, you know, giggling at my story, humoring me. I appreciate it. We, we've been sitting on that one for a long time, so I was excited to, to tell it tonight. But I'll close this out in a prayer if you all pray with me. Lord, we thank you for being in our presence tonight, and we're humbled by it. We thank you for this life that you've blessed us with, and we thank you for the variety of people that you've created. We thank you that we're all not the same, that we all have different views, we all have different traits, that we all add different things to the kingdom. And Lord, we pray that we look at those differences 
as strengths and not weaknesses. We pray that we lift each other up, that we encourage each other, and that we love each other as you loves us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for forgiving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you all next week for the last time. <laughs>